makes it tough. Okay, two primary topics that, that I was going to cover today. So when we were doing the deal review, we talked about the expense database. I give you a little preview of that. So I'm, I'm okay making this available for you guys to use if you want. It's completely optional. I would say this is very much a beta tool. Uh, I haven't spent the time to make it absolutely bulletproof. So if you use this tool, it's going to be entirely up to you to ensure that the data you're putting into it is accurate to the best of your ability. If you're, if you're not being careful with the data you put in, then that the results are going to be not reliable. So what I figured I'll do is I'll, I'll just give you another preview. I'm, I'm going to use this video also. I'm going to use this video as kind of the training video, and I'm going to embed it into this tool before I release it. But I will use this to kind of give you a quick preview of the tool and how it works. Uh, I'll, I'll cover how to update the expense database. And then we'll do just a very slight amount of pivot table training because I know not everybody is familiar with pivot tables, but this tool is definitely dependent on a pivot table. Okay. So first and foremost, we'll go ahead and take a look at the expense database. Uh, sorry, the output. Okay. So the idea is that this database captures it essentially just the 12 data that I'm collecting on for the properties I've evaluated. And I only upload the T12 data for the properties I feel are fairly well managed. If it's a very distressed property, I don't want to upload it into the database because it's going to skew the data, right? I want to be able to use this as a reference as I underwrite to see what the common expense, uh, expense per door or expense ratios are or expense items are for an area I'm underwriting to. So that's... That's how I kind of selectively choose which of properties to upload into this. Um, so with that said, uh, I've I've been doing this for almost seven or eight months now, and I've got quite a few properties in here. Uh, I actually had our VA go back to previous underwriting models and upload data. So that helped. Uh, I would say this right now is optimized to version 5.37. Uh, so if you have that version and you've underwritten deals, you can go back to your previous underwriting files. There's a hidden tab, I'll show you how to do this, and you can upload it into this database. So you can kind of start to consolidate all of it. But as you see, I'm not capturing everything from your underwriting. Again, this was, I mean, I would love to do that, but that's a much bigger task. This is really intended to be kind of like a guideline for my expenses and other income as I underwrite my pro forma data. Uh, so what I do is I always upload T3 income. You can see that. Let me guess, zoom in a little bit. So I always upload T3 income and I upload T12 expenses. And it's, it's really important to make sure you're capturing the same snapshot every single time. Otherwise, again, it could skew your data. So this is what I tend to upload, T3 income, T12 expenses. Uh, and you can see it has all the same categories for income and expenses that exist in the underwriting file. So it matches exactly. I'm also capturing the whisper price and the cap rate for the whisper price. And then I convert everything to uh, you know, dollars per unit per year, basically. And then at the very bottom, you see expense ratio and net operating income. And so what this allows me to do is I uh, put these slicers here so I can just look at Georgia, for example. I could collapse that. And then I can see for all the Georgia properties that I've underwritten, you see the uh, total other income is around $2,000 a door. That's helpful. Average expenses for these properties is about 7200 It's about 43% expense ratio. And then I could say, well, I, I tend to look uh, the, the two things I tend to focus most on as I'm underwriting different regions, I, I look at payroll a lot because that tends to fluctuate depending where you're at in the country. Uh, I also look at utilities. So you can see utilities in Georgia, is specifically Atlanta, right? So if I filtered this for just Atlanta, you're going to see it's, it's very expensive, right? $1,400 a door for utilities. So Atlanta has some of the highest um, water rates out there, so very expensive. So I, I tend to look at these two things. These are big expenses that swing the underwriting quite a bit from region to region. Uh, and then you could also look at the taxes, but I always recommend going and pulling the latest tax information, understanding what the millage rate is and 
coming up with your own tax projection. So that's a quick overview. Uh, we're going to come back to this in a little bit, and I'll show you exactly how the pivot table works so you can kind of manipulate it, but there's not much there. Uh, that said, we're going to go ahead and update one right now. So I'm going to go into the underwriting file, uh, and this is just a standard underwriting file. I'm in version 5.38. This is the same as 5.37. This is a version I'm, I'm hoping to release this weekend, we'll, we'll talk towards the end of this meeting about some of the updates that I made. Uh, but there's a hidden file or a hidden tab in this underwriting file. And all you have to do to access that is just right click any tab in the file and just do unhide. And you're going to see this expense database, expense DB. So you want and, and this is automatically linked. So let me expand this. This is linked to your underwriting file. There are really no inputs that you have to make, but you definitely want to verify. Oh, actually, so this is, <laughs> I lied. There are a couple inputs that you should make. Uh, the date of analysis, right? So this is intended to be able to capture when did you look at this property? Because if you start building out this expense database, and let's say you have two years worth of data at some point, you're, you're really not going to want to focus on the data from two years ago you're going to want something more recent. So that's why we capture the date here. So you put in your date. So actually for this one, we'll just do 315. Um, it's going to try to determine your city and this, if the MSA is an input uh, and the state. It's going to try and determine these two fields, but verify those uh, and then put in your MSA. And I'm just going to leave these as is, but those are basically the four fields that are going to allow you to filter the data once you import it. So you want to verify those are all accurate. Um, the other thing is, like I mentioned, uh, you, you really want to make sure your, your data is complete, right? I really strongly recommend against uploading any T3 or T12 data that is missing values or fields or that is incomplete because it will impact the output. So for this one, I could see that uh, my expense ratio is a little high, but it's complete. I have all the categories filled out. Uh, I've already underwritten this deal, so I'm comfortable with the, the historical data and I want to capture it. And this is what I do on every deal we look at. I always look at the T12 data and I actually, I have our VA do this step for us. But every deal that we set up, I'll, I'll evaluate the T12 and I will let her know whether to upload it or not into the expense database. But okay, so to upload it, you just click this button, copy values. And it just copies this range. And then you go back to the expense database. And all you have to do is click this paste values button. And you see it just pasted in all those values. And so simple enough. One thing to keep in mind, sometimes you might have a positive loss to lease. So let me just put a positive number. It's going to give you a warning. So any of the uh, income losses, uh, they're, they're typically negative. So if it notices that you're, you've are you got a positive value, it's just gonna bring a warning. If that's accurate, then it's fine. It's just a warning. And again, verify these inputs. These are very important to be able to filter the data. So everything looks good for me. Uh, I am actually, yeah, California, yeah, let's, let's go with that. So once the data is pasted in here, you just click save to database. And all this does, and, and I call it a database, it's really a table in Excel, acts a little like a database. All this is doing is it's just writing each of these values into the table, and I'll show you what that looks like. So now I'm going to click on this database tab, and at the very end of this list, you see it just, let's go over here, it just wrote in this data right here. That's all it did, it was added that. Okay. And then we go to the output. So the way to uh, make this data available is you have to refresh this pivot table, right? It's not going to show in the data until you refresh it. So all the only, well, the easiest way to refresh it is just right click anywhere on this pivot table and then click refresh. And it's not going to change right now because this pivot table is filtered for Georgia, as you can see right here. We need to change it to California. 
So this is going to get into how do we manip manipulate this pivot table so we see the data we want to see. I've included these filters. These are the three most common filters I, I use is state, MSA, and city. So right now it's filtered for Georgia and Atlanta. And to undo the filter, there's a couple, couple ways. <clears throat> the uh, easiest is just to click this filter with the X and it undoes the MSA filter. And now I'm going to click the filter for state. And now I can click California. And there's the data that I just uploaded. And so I can see it has all the information that I just uploaded. So pretty easy process. It takes literally a minute, maybe two minutes to just unhide that tab, copy, paste, update database. So it, I find it very helpful, especially as I've like gotten more properties into the tool uh, for the markets we're looking at. I've actually referred to it quite a bit, but it takes a little bit of time to build up that, that history or going back to old models and uploading to this. So I will pause there. Any questions? Uh, yeah, can we? Uh, is it possible to add this to the uh, MFA? These all these um, tabs, or should we keep it completely separate? I I would keep it sec separate. I think the issue with the MFA right now is it's it's getting a little bit heavy. There's a lot. There are literally like sixty thousand formulas in the MFA, and so um, just adding more overhead just makes it heavier. And this this is something that's kind of a one off. So I I think for this reason is mostly why I'm keeping it separate. Got it. So do you not recommend adding tabs to the MFA at all? Or No, you can. And I should also mention that, that another reason why this is separate is I'm consolidating information from multiple different MFAs, right? That would be hard to do in, in one underwriting file, right? As you underwrite more and more deals. Got it. Yeah. Because I add like population data, market tracker, yeah. and costs, you know, uh, CoStar you know, vacancy information to the yeah. MFA. Yeah, so. I do the same thing. Okay. Yeah, I would say just the, um, just something like this, that like pivot tables take up memory, right? Because so what, what a pivot table is doing in Excel is it's storing the entire data set in memory. And so it just, it starts to make the file a little bit bigger, a little bit slower, the more I do. So I'm just trying to keep it separately. But I think the, the bigger issue is like, yeah, um, that this is the consolidation of probably like 40 different MFA files. Um, so I have a question, Greg, do you have any um, criteria you, you had in mind for deciding what's a well-managed property um, since you're going to be allowing multiple users to input into this just to keep it, oh. it you know, with good information in it, um, yeah. Let, what should we abide by? Good question. Let me just clarify this. This is going to be available to each individual user. There's no way for us to really consolidate our information through this tool right now. Oh, okay. So it's it's individual. As far as criteria, um, I mean, I mean, you know, like when you start underwriting in a certain area, you start to get to know a little bit, like what what a a well-run property looks like and a poorly run property. But generally speaking, I'm looking for, you know, roughly like expense ratios within the range, right? Like probably 40, it depends on the area. It really depends on the area, but expense ratios that are in line with what I would expect for that area, I guess I should say, mm -hmm. right? So Texas, it might be north of 50% and South Carolina it might be a little bit south of 50%. Right. But somewhere in that ballpark. And and really like those things are helpful, right? The expense ratio, because it tells me like the expenses are either in line or out of line with the income. But if the property is lagging on income, right? If they haven't raised rents in a while, then your expense ratio might be high and that might be okay. Uh, it just depends on how you want to use it. Like I said, I tend to use this. I really want to understand other income right? Like what's normal for the area? Because I, I noticed this varies a bit between regions. And then, uh, like I said, payroll and utilities tend to be 
kind of big ones. Repairs and maintenance too is really inter interesting for the different areas. So, so I, I tend to look at it per line item. And as long as those fields are complete, that's usually pretty good. That makes sense. I thought that you were like opening this up for everybody to put in. And that's why I was like, we want to definitely have a standard to make yeah. sure. I mean, I wish I could. I wish there was a way to easily do that. Um, but I mean, even so, let me preface again this is a beta model, it's not bulletproof. Right. <laughs> so even my VA, like, uh, so, sometimes I'll miss something and, and it gets uploaded and I'll notice something is off, right? Like maybe my, some of my expenses. So there have been um, T12s that will have negative expenses instead of in a positive value. So we've had one of those uploaded. So I'm, I'm constantly reviewing this probably like once every two or three weeks, I'll probably have to go in and kind of like verify that what was uploaded matches the T12. And then sometimes I'm making corrections. I'll actually go into this database. I'm like, no, these these were all positive values. All the other income or income losses, I need to switch those to negative so it fits. So, like I said, I don't have those automated checks in this tool right now. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really important to make sure that the data you're uploading is clean. Makes sense. Yeah, I I tried to carve out time to kind of put a little bit more checks and balances into the adding it to this table but it's just it's going to take a significant amount of time and i've just been so busy lately oh i think it's great to have this at all so definitely appreciative of it it's been very helpful for us for me in particular um and like i said we we actually went through uh here's a deal so we went through and we we literally all the deals that we've underwritten in the last like I forget. We we did this exercise probably Q3 of last year and I built this. And we went back and we looked at all the deals we did for 2023 up to that point and went one by one. Can we get it in there? These are the deals we did not add because there's no T12s, make ready with zero, or and you can see 75 expense ratio. We're like, no, that that's mm -hmm. out of line. So it took a little while to set up. I bet. Okay. Any other questions? I'll kind of talk to the pivot table aspect real quick. Okay. So as I mentioned, this is all managed in a pivot table. And if you're not familiar with the pivot table, it's um it's a really uh I'd say cool way to analyze data, right? So it's just taking the data from this table has all these columns and it's just organizing it in a way that's more useful, right? That I can analyze. Uh, you don't really need to make any changes to this pivot table at all. You don't need to add fields or remove fields. Everything is captured in here. Um, so um, if you do end up changing some of the fields, this is another reason it's not exactly bulletproof. Let's see, um, let me review. You see, th these are all the things, the items that are in here. If you end up moving one of these or like pivot tables or drag and drop. So you can see I can like this item, I can move item out of the way. And then all of a sudden it breaks in my pivot table, right? Like this doesn't make any sense. So I'd recommend being very careful not to drag and drop. Like just leave as is. What you need to understand about the pivot table is just how to filter for the data you want. And again, I've included these filters here for state, MSA, and city. This is most of what I use, but I also do a collapse fields because this, this view right here is a little bit hard for me to understand, right? I can look at all these individual properties, but I kind of, I'd rather see the total. So right now I'm filtered for Georgia. What I can do is I could collapse fields. So the way you do that, is this pivot table analyze at the top of my screen. And then there's this collapse field option. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna collapse all the fields for, I think this is the MSA field. Right? So all the MSA names, it's gonna collapse those. So watch what happens when they do that. So 
So there you go. So group all the MSA. So all the properties that roll up under Atlanta. Now I can see Atlanta next to Evans, Georgia, next to Savannah, Augusta. Augusta. And let's say I only want to look at um, Georgia. I mean, Atlanta. I can do that. And then now maybe I want to see the actual properties that I'm, or the cities in Atlanta or I can ungroup this. I can either click the plus sign or I could click on the field and click expand field and see everything that kind of is nested underneath it. So it's just the properties. So these are all the properties in Atlanta that this is summarizing. So again, it's a pretty long list. And then my totals, but I tend to, I tend to look at the totals instead of the individual properties. Once in a while, I will look at individual properties just to see, because based on which for price, I could get a feel for how big the property is. Sometimes smaller properties may have higher expense ratios, but then I can group this. And now you can see, this is the total for all of my Atlanta properties that I've in, or uploaded. So that's, those are the, the features I use most often is this grouping. You can click the pluses. Uh, the plus, I'll show you one thing about the plus. So right here, yeah, okay. So right now, this, this pivot is very large. It's looking at all of Georgia and all the cities in Georgia that I've uploaded. And so it's a lot. Sometimes clicking, I don't usually click the plus too much unless I'm looking at one individual category because what happens here, if I click the minus, if I want to group Atlanta, it's only going to group Atlanta and everything else is still broken out. Right? For that reason, I usually just use this collapse field. So pivot table analyze and I go to collapse field and then it groups all the cities. And then you can expand field, it'll expand every city. So just to recap, I would strongly recommend you avoid dragging any of these fields because pivot tables, like I said, you could drag and drop fields. That will ruin the uh, uh, structure of the pivot table, the way it's laid out. And then primarily use the filters for filtering your data and then you could collapse or expand different categories. Okay. Any questions on that? Nope, that's pretty clear to me. Okay. So, yeah, so Victoria, to your point, like I, and I would, I mean, that's kind of my dream is is to be able to upload your data in the MFA, upload it to a database. That way you can always go back to a deal, populate the MFA, you could um, adjust it, upload it. And then if all the data is in a database, you could do stuff like this, like on steroids. You could do way more than just this expense database, but <laughs> that's a very big project. Yeah, that sounds like a huge project. It'd be pretty cool though. Okay. Okay. Like I said, I'm going to put together a video. I'll pop it into this thing. I'm, I've got to write out some instructions, basically what we covered today. Oh, deleting data. Let's talk about that first. Okay. So we talked about corrupting data, deleting data. So I actually just uploaded something I didn't want in my database. I don't want this because this is a fake deal. And the way you delete the data, it's pretty straightforward, it is uh, right here. So you can see ABC apartment homes. I don't want that. So I'm just going to highlight ABC apartment homes. And then I'm going to right click it. And then I'm going to delete. I'm going to delete table rows. It's that easy. So highlight, right click, go to delete and table rows. And now it's gone. And so again, anytime you make a change to this table, either by uploading your new data or deleting data that exists in there, you have to go to your pivot table 
and I was right clicking and refresh. And you'll see California disappeared from this list. It's no longer available. Okay. All right, I gotta finish writing out these instructions. I'll do the video and then I'll make this available to you guys if you wanna download it and use it. Okay. Okay, second topic I've gotten a lot of questions on, which is how do you uh, underwrite a JV deal? And so this is a short topic, but I wanted to cover it so we have it. Okay, so a JV deal is pretty easy to underwrite, but maybe not super intuitive. I'm gonna collapse everything so we can see. So essentially by modeling a JV deal, what you're doing is you're just not including any LP, limited partner investors, JV deal. So the way you do that is this preferred return, you just set it to zero because there's no, there's not gonna be any LP partner. And then you wanna cut out the partner completely from the deal, which means you wanna zero out this LP partnership and you do that by setting the GP to 100%. So what this is doing now is it's going to bypass that entire partner section of the returns. So let's look at that. Okay. okay. Right here, the LP return. So you have project returns. They're still happening. There's no preferred return due or paid and then this is the lp section it goes all the cash flow that gets thrown off from the property skips the lp return section and goes straight into the gp section so 100 percent of the project earnings land in the gp and then what you could do is you can always use the gp split worksheet to figure out your partnership splits right you can organize this any way you want you can change this to like pre-close work, however you want, what percentage GP, and then what percentage like partner one gets, partner two, you can do the same thing for the asset management because that's the one that grabs the asset management fee. Whoops, there we go. No, sorry, there's so many groupings. Okay, so here's your asset management. Let's say 40% of the deal goes towards asset management, Partner one, yeah, they're going to do most of it. They're going to get 75%. And then we can zero out all these other things. So you split that, and you see it's going to split that asset management fee between these two partners. So you could go through each of these buckets of work and split out the work between partner one and partner two, or however many partners are part of the JV. And then that will determine how the acquisition fee, all the cash flow and refinance and uh, sale proceeds are split between those partners. Any questions on that? I like it. Um, so <clears throat> I guess we would also on the top line, you would toggle from cash and cash LP to cash and cash project. Perfect. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, so that's going to be the metric you're going to want to track. Okay. Any questions? Pretty clear? Yeah, maybe there needs to be a JV toggle. I don't know. Um, last but not least, I wanted to talk about I'm, I'm getting ready to release this version, 5.3a. I'm hoping to get that done this weekend. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the changes that are included, and they're not significant, but there are several changes that I'm working through. So the renovation timeline. So this renovation timeline uh, previously would only go to 36 months. Uh, this is now extended. So now you could go to 60 months, five years. Uh, one unique thing is, uh, I was talking to somebody about a deal and they're like, we don't want to start renovations right now. 
we want to wait till the market improves and we expect to start renovations in year three and we expect to go from year three to five well now you you could do that you could say renovations start in month 36 and they end in month 60 if you want well it looks like i need to update this right here but yeah so that's that's a big change let's go okay here Oh, this is another one. I don't know why it took me so long to do this one. It was actually much easier than expected. So one thing that I, I've struggled with this too, is like you'll get a rent roll and there'll be partially renovated units. There'll be fully renovated units or they might have a silver and gold or something like that. Well, now we have two tiers of renovation you can designate. You do uh, full perfect. Partial. Oh, I yeah. love that. I, I yeah, me too. putting the little P at the end. It takes me yeah. long because I'm not as good as Excel as you are. Yeah, exactly. I kept doing that too. And I, it's just one of those, I just don't know why. It was super easy to do this. It took like 10 minutes. I don't know why it took me so long. Uh, and I having see like 10 units, I mean, uh, 10 unit types. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing that's, now that you're going to have a classic, a partial, and a full, you got to pay attention to the number of unit types for sure. It could expand pretty quickly. Uh, that full and partial is also now carried into the unit mix. So you see full and partial here. Nice. Great. Great. How does it aggregate um, in the table for the unit mix on, on the rent roll, on the rent roll formatter? Uh, input, sorry, sorry uh, yeah. rental input. Doesn't doesn't it aggregate by like square footage first, or again when we have like yeah. multiple multiple units of the same square footage, but they're um, renovated at different levels? How does that how does that work? Right here, so it it aggregates based on whichever selections you choose from square foot, bed, bath, and the renovated status. So in this case, we have one one six fifty a partial. And then we have 11650R, which is renovated, fully renovated. So Got it. Th this is the aggregator. So even if I were to manually type over this, uh, actually, I'm not going to do it because I'm going to lose my formula, but I can manually type over. I could say silver unit, blue unit, whatever you put in this field is what then gets carried into this rent roll summary. And then if you populate your unit mix from this, that's what gets put into your unit mix. So the whole model is based really on this name. You, 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 you mentioned you didn't want to overwrite your formula. Well, what's the reason for that? Oh, for right for right now, I just didn't want to do it. Got I'm it, but, 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 but we can, right? Obviously. Yeah, for sure. You can, the problem is you, you lose the formula, right? And you see the formula, it's kind of long. So, but yeah, I mean, I could, let's say gold, right? I could do it. And now gold is going to show up here so it's the gold unit right and then so now but the problem is i just i just lost the formula here so but fortunately i have it down below i could just paste formulas here and put it back yeah i could do that but yeah so anywhere you see an orange font you can definitely overwrite those formulas but that's that's kind of how I designed this. This is the beauty of this system is it allows you to aggregate all those unit types into whatever categories or buckets that you want. Whatever makes sense for your analysis. But yeah, so now we have that full and partial. That yeah. should be helpful. Um, yeah, so I fixed something. This is a really one-off case, but uh, somebody was trying to model a deal that was full cash. And they notice the cash flow available for distribution threw off the calculation. So I fixed that. Um, just a tip. Yep. So the tax calculation in the expenses. If you were to set your taxes to on here, it pulls from the tax tab. And what was happening is this first cell right here was incorrectly referencing year one of the tax table instead of year two. Oh my God, that, that, I was having such a problem with that. I, was, I thought I was going oh. crazy. <laughs> yeah, so sorry about that. Yeah, it's just an oversight. And now that's fixed in this one. Oh. 
uh, total revenue for the Academy Duke. Yeah, that one is a little return to capital. Yeah, these are just like minor things. Full, partial. Oh, I added um, a row into the tax tab. If you wanted to, oh, stop. If you want to just uh, manu like set your growth rates for tax in this table as you're modeling it out, you can now. So you can say it's going to grow 5% a year. You can grow your taxes as you model it. Before I wasn't able to do that. So you can do that but now. Does that change the growth rate on the bottom of the underwriting model tab to match that? Or is that? No, it does not. Because if you, so right now with this set to off, it's using the growth rate down below. Oh, okay. If you turn this to on, it's going to pull from the tax tab. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. So it's two separate. And then other income remote. Record. Oh, yeah. So there was a really one-off case issue with the other income. Uh, if if you were, and I literally could not, could not figure out why this was doing it, this formula, for some reason, if you were trying to model one income unit, it was throwing off this formula. And it had something to do with the year up here. I, I couldn't figure it out. I spent a lot of time on it. So I ended up rewriting the formula completely, but now it works if you do one income unit. I shouldn't. Shouldn't have any issues. But before, if you did one income unit, it, it was throwing off the year one calculation. And then there's one additional enhancement I'm working through right now. It's it's kind of the start of a bigger enhancement. But um, I'm getting a lot of requests now for loan assumptions, right? We're doing one right now. I think they're becoming a lot more commonplace. Uh, if, if you're still within the IO period of a loan assumption, it's just a matter of putting in your loan amount uh, and all the terms, and then the remaining IO that's left on the loan. If your loan is being amortized, if you're past the IO portion, it's much harder to model that with this structure, right? Because so then, basically, when, you, when you go to, an, when you go to an, uh, uh, a new loan, then you would just do, use a refinance, right? Yeah. Yeah, if you're gonna refinance out of an assumption, just yeah. use the refinance. Yeah. So what I'm I'm gonna do is like it it shouldn't be that difficult, but I'm gonna I think I'm gonna have to kind of bake it in into these cells or something. I'm running out of room, but what I want to do is I want to have if if you're gonna do a loan assumption, then you pick uh the month that you're gonna assume that loan in. Right. So you put in all the original terms of that loan assumption, right? Including if it's a three-year IO, you put in three-year IO, you model this as if it were the loan on day one. And then you say which month you're going to assume that loan. And then what it's going to do is going to look down the, the loan table and then populate the loan from that point forward. So that's that's my fix for right now. But longer term, I'm trying to figure out a better method for engineering or modeling your capital stack. So what I want to have is your primary loan. I want to have an assumption. I want to have a second or supplemental. I want to have pref equity and I want to have a refinance. And the cool thing, if I can do each of those, I'll be able to show you your cost of capital, right? So I can aggregate each of those. I can figure out how much they're costing you in the deal, including your private equity. And then I could show you cost of capital like so you could start to play with your capital stack to see what provides lower cost of capital because lower cost of capital is going to yield better returns so i don't know i don't think i've seen that in a model yet the cost of capital yet but i think it's probably something we should be looking at that would be really cool yeah thanks yeah i think it'd be super cool and honestly i'm i'm just, I, my biggest struggle is I, I could build that. It's not a big deal. <laughs> like I have most of that already modeled. It's like, just how do I fit it in this? That's my biggest. So I may I may um, break out another section below this in between these two sections. And it might be your capital stack. That way you have room to just model your capital stack. And I can build you a graph nested in that section that shows you what each part of your capital stack costs you. 
in the deal. So that's kind of a bigger lift. So the assumption is the first part of this bigger uh, enhancement that I'm kind of thinking through right now. Okay. I think that's most everything I had to cover today. Are there any questions, any comments? Any chance for an IR hurdle? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's another one where it's, um, I'm running in a room. Yeah. So, the, so there's, there's three big enhancements I'm, I'm really trying to think through right now, right? One is the capital stack. The other is the return uh, structure. Right. And then the third one, to your point, Victoria, thanks for your feedback, by the way, is sensitivity tables. Right. Yeah. So you can start to see how everything plays out. And if if I move the debt structure into its own section, that gives me a lot more room to model a more complicated return structure in this section. But yeah, so to your point, I've already got it modeled out. I have a class A, B, pref right? Uh, cash on cash pref like this. And I also have a class AB IR four tier waterfall, all modeled out on its own tab, ready to go. Uh, the, the challenge is how do I integrate it into this? And it's not just integrating it into this part. It's like all the dependent features in the model, right? So the summary tab, all the return stuff, everywhere else this goes into the model, I got to intercept. And then once I integrate it, it breaks some of my macros, so I got to deal with that too. So, so then you would just you would you would just do your inputs in this section? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, most likely. Yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. If 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 I could, like I said, if I can move my capital stack in its own section, so you can just spend time modeling your capital stack, then it gives me a little bit of room right here to kind of do your waterfall. And so the, the thing we do in the waterfall is you have to allocate your equity between the LP and the GP. And if you have two classes of shares, you're going to have to allocate equity between, so essentially this equity amount, it's 9.7, has to be allocated between the GP, class A, and class B share. And then the rest is pretty straightforward. But So, yeah, I have it all modeled. It's just uh, the, the time required to kind of actually make it work in here without breaking everything else. Sounds like a big undertaking for sure. Yeah. Well, and it's not just, I'll probably reach out to some of you, but it's not just like once I get it integrated, I mean, that's that's a lot of time right there, but it's also testing it, right? Because there are always things that you just don't foresee breaking <laughs> that end up breaking, right? That you don't catch. So yeah, we can get some people for easy. testing. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I, I'd say the way my time works on these enhancements, the big ones, like there's the development of the model, right? On those ones, it's, it's quite a bit of time. There's also the testing, which is almost as much time sometimes. And then there's like all these great video tutorials that I've written or that I've done. <laughs> that That is almost as time consuming as everything else. <laughs> Trying to update documentation. Yeah, so I'm open to ideas though, because you guys are obviously uh, well versed in the model. If, if you have ideas for integrating, if I'm open, I've. But yeah, those are the big ones on my list. Uh, Craig, how do you underwrite a T one? A what? At you know, like one month's financial. Like someone just gave me like the updated February financial. Oh. Yeah. Uh, with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't put a lot of faith in it, right? So, I mean, you can, you, you can dump in your. You your, just do it manually? Well, I mean, uh, uh, what I would do is you could put it in manually or you could just paste it in here, right? If you only have a T1. Yeah, I've done it. that. And then I try to annualize it, but I couldn't figure it out. You toggle yeah. on the underwriting. Yeah. So it'd be right here. You just switch this to T1. So to take that that one month. It will it'll only give you the T1 though, then won't it? Yeah. Well, it's giving you the T1 annualized. Okay. Yeah. If you need help with that, let me know. Happy to okay, share. Definitely. That. Definitely. 
Craig, I do have one other question real quick, man. Sure. Um, this is in regards to other income. There was a, a topic we were talking about a few weeks back, and you, I think you said you had a conversation with a broker who said anything over about 10% of other income is um, probably a little bit too much. I think typically it needs to be around that 5 to 10%. Is that kind of what we said? Or eight, yeah, maybe 8 to 10 and I'm going to preface with the thing I would say is like, it's very specific to market and deal, deal size and all that. But when I was working with a, um, I, I worked through this, this model right here. I, I literally sent a property manager that we like very much in Atlanta. I sent him this, this model and the expenses. And I'm like, Hey, hey can you help me understand uh, the cost per door of what I can expect? for class A, B, and C properties in Atlanta, in and around Atlanta. And he, he helped me out a lot. And um, yeah, that was his feedback. Is for the Atlanta market, if you're seeing other income as, you know, north of 10 to 12%, he's like, it's getting kind of frothy, right? That's, that might not be realistic for that market. And that, include, that, that includes rubs, correct? Yes. Okay. So, so one of the things I'm hearing is a trend of, of is converting some of the parking into storage, uh, especially if it's covered oh. parking. Um, hmm. And so, interesting. Um, with that, and I, I I've included that as other income. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that is that ten percent because you can uh, in Dallas you're we able to capture a good bit of per month for a storage unit on site. Yep. So. I didn't know if that would be applied to the 10% or not. I mean, probably not. I guess it'd be on top of. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would, I would say anything that you're going to collect that's outside of rent is considered other income. Right. So that, that storage would be included in that. But again, like I said, that was 10%. I mean, like if that, if that's your five to 10%, does that, is that rule of thumb still apply? I, I, you know, I would always, tell you to like talk to a local property manager. They'll have a much better answer than what I can give you, yeah. especially for Dallas. I'm not familiar with that market, but maybe there's like in the, the market you're in, maybe there is a, a, a bigger need for storage, bigger need for these extra amenities, right? That can help drive the other income. Paul, I would, I would think that that would go on, on top of the other income and like, that's the other, the other income value add. Um, I would think you would be able to, throw that on top of obviously just make sure there's a demand for it but i would think you would be able to throw that on top of yeah thank you for that. all right great any other questions it's good stuff yeah, i do have a question so you know on expenses are you able to break out like at another line item I mean, am I allowed to, I mean, am I able to add like a legal line item? Uh, you know how there's a lot of GNA gets all mixed in there. And if you just want to see what mm -hmm. your looks like, you know, because sometimes people don't account for legal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately in the model, no. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a bit difficult to add additional items just because everything is, is linked to this drop down. And then also if you start using the expense database, it all matches to that got it, so, got it yeah i've i've gone back and forth on this uh because i i also especially more so on the other income items right because i kind of want to see model units I, I tend to spend time on that model units i want to see um some of the other income items broken out like what is the actual rubs for water and sewer and what is uh pest and, and those items and so because of that, I end up spending more time in this T12, like modeling all that stuff down at the bottom of the T12, just so I can see those breakouts. And I've considered adding that. I've gotten mixed feedback because I've kind of pulled people. I'm like, hey, would it help you to have these additional things? And, you know, everyone has their own opinion. And I think a lot of the feedback I've gotten is like, man, this is just getting really into the weeds. <laughs> so... I'm definitely open to suggestions. Yeah, so if there are things you want to see, please send it over to me. I really do keep an enhancement list. Like every request I get, I log it into a table. So 
as I'm reviewing enhancements to do, I'm like, I'm, I'm really going through that and I prioritize all these enhancements. So anything you can think of, I can't promise everything, but I definitely want to capture enhancements. Hey, Craig, I will ask this. I don't know if you have any feedback on this. We talk about market specific utilities. Is there a way just to, you know, I, I don't, how do you get a better handle on that? Like you were asking your, you were asking your PM or the, the PM that you trusted um, in Atlanta, but I mean, how do you get a good handle on that as far as what the utility should be in a market? Yeah. Uh, honestly, do you, just, do you just go off of the T12? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times the T12 looks like it's, it's pretty Plus 10% good. maybe. Yeah, no, I usually just take whatever's in the T12, right, for my initial. So like you see in this example, I mean, this is a fake deal, but I mean, 741, I'll just kind of round up just to capture a little bit. But uh, when I do see, uh, like when I started underwriting in Atlanta, I'm like, man, these utilities, like you see this, let's see, I forget where this one is located actually, but but um, Atlanta was consistently over a thousand dollars a door, like twelve hundred dollars a door, I'm like, man, really expensive. And then I, I contacted a property manager and they're like, oh yeah, Atlanta's got some of the highest water rates in the country. I had no idea. So but yeah, I was I was relying on the T12 initially until I got that feedback. And then we talked you and I talked about the um lender capex reserves. Did that ever get uh did we ever discuss about how that gets returned potentially to the to the ownership group yeah so i did not make that in so it's i i talked to one of our lenders about that and he said mm -hmm. sometimes it's returned i think some operators try to use it but yeah i have not baked anything into the model to return the lender capex re reserves so the way it works, you you would typically put some sort of lender capex reserves in an escrow account. Is that right? And then, mm -hmm. and then that that will potentially get returned to you from the lender, or they have they have the option of not returning that to you. No, no, though it's your money. It's in the escrow yeah. account. But typically, as you, as you make repairs to the property, you're going to request a draw against that reserve account. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, where is it? Not, and then at and then at the end, if there's anything remaining, then you're able to. Yeah. Okay. Yes, in this case, 197. Yeah, and I did go through and I looked at. I I probably have about maybe 15 or 20 other underwriting models that I, I look at, and um, yeah, I've not seen a return of lender capex reserves in any any of them. Operating, we we do like this one. The operating uh, account, we yeah. do, but yeah. yeah, not the other. So yeah, I'm hesitant okay. to kind of put that in, but yeah, understood. And then, is there a certain dashboard that you kind of keep track of all your deals on? Like, how do you keep track of all these deals, man? What what have you been? What have you found to be the most effective way and efficient way to keep track of all of these deals? Yeah, so we use HubSpot. Use HubSpot, okay. Yeah, we yeah. I just spent a lot of time automating our deal setup. So now, so I use Zapier, and then now we can send an email. I create an email account. We can send an email to it, and just with some basic information and all the deal we're underwriting files, and it sets up a sh uh, a folder on our shared drive, titles it for the deal, and then it sets up a deal in HubSpot. And it puts in all the information for us. And then I built a couple of dashboards in HubSpot. So we, we every week we, we review our indicators. And some of those are like how many new deals came into our system, where are they on the pipeline, how many LOIs have we submitted, all those things. It's all through HubSpot. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. So a CRM is really helpful. Uh, before I joined Cree, uh, I was using Monday.com and I had a very similar process where I just had a Kanban, right? Really, it was like deal created, deal in review, deal pass, you know, all that stuff. And um, with my partner before this, we did the same thing. We just had a I little don't know. Oh, go ahead. 
I don't know if it would be helpful for everybody in the group. That would be something I'd be really interested in seeing how you guys do that. But I don't know if that's something that would be helpful for everybody else. So that may be something different. Yeah, I'm open to it. You guys would find value in it. I know, Victoria, you guys look at quite a few deals. How do you keep track of yours? Um, we use, um, we actually just use Excel for keeping track of, of the actual deals. And then obviously we use HubSpot and Active Campaign for our CRM and our marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Active Campaign is fairly popular too. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing how you guys do that though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to show you. I don't think Rod would mind. Cool. Then we'll call it a wrap. Thank you guys for attending and I'll send you. you guys some content this weekend. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Thanks Craig. Craig. Appreciate your time. Yep. Thank you, Craig. Yeah.